Welcome to the StartupCamp.com podcast, where each week our goal is to bring you some of the most influential entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and best-selling authors of our time. Leaders such as Dave Ramsey. People that, whether they're wealthy or whether they're not, that are other-centered are attractive people. People that are self-centered are not attractive people. That's humility. Pat Flynn. Your earnings are a byproduct of how well you serve your audience. And Patrick Lynchoni. If you want to have a team culture, if you're really truly interested in teamwork, then you have to find people who have these three qualities. At Startup Camp, our goal is to see every entrepreneur build a successful life and business. My name is Chris Graby. I am your host. I hope you came ready. Buckle up. The Startup Camp podcast starts right now. Well, if you've been living under a rock the last few years, you know nothing about CrossFit. But if you are a regular human being that's been out in the world, you have seen CrossFit explode. And on today's episode, we're going to be talking to literally the man himself, Ben Bergeron, one of the very first people to jump into the CrossFit games. And he has coached six world champion athletes that are literally reigning as the fittest man and the fittest woman on earth. And he talks about the principles that he uses, not just in CrossFit, but how they absolutely transition over to building your business. You're going to love this dude. Ben is a great guy. He's going to share some awesome stories about the CrossFit community, but also talk about his business. Get ready. Here's Ben. Ben, welcome to the Startup Camp Podcast. We're so glad you're here, man. Thanks. Happy to be here, man. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to dive into all the things that you're doing, the book you've written, the companies you started, the podcast you got. But before we do all that, just take a second and tell our audience a little bit about you, who you are, a little bit about your story, family, all that good stuff. So grew up in the Northeast outside of Boston, uh, went to school in Vermont um, for business, after school, kind of spent a year being a ski bum, living the dream, came back and kind of buckled down and did the corporate thing and very quickly realized that it wasn't for me, but didn't really have an impetus to change anything until 9-11 happened. And that was the impetus. I, I, I quit my job and um, doing investment banking um, and left to kind of figure out what I want to be. And uh, I had a hard time figuring out what that was, but I knew I wanted to have some purpose. I didn't want to push money around or sit in a cubicle. So I was thinking about either becoming like a firefighter or joining the military and um, actually finally settled on becoming a personal trainer and uh, moved back. I was in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, trying to figure out my life, skiing Mm -hmm. again, and then came back and uh, started doing it, started doing the the kind of the personal training thing and found CrossFit a few years in, Um, started doing that with some of my clients, started like the magic started to happen. I, I drank the Kool-Aid, as they say, and started to uh, get into the CrossFit as a sport and training some elite athletes. And fast forward uh, 10 or 12 years and um, have a few gyms now, um, trained and coached uh, a handful of individual winners at the CrossFit Games and Masters winners and coached teams that have won. And now I have a, uh, a training platform that I, people kind of share our, our methodologies for how we train and the mindset that we use on comp train. That's views, you know, it gets about a million views a month. It's a little niche. It's a niche inside of a niche where CrossFit inside of fitness, but it's a place where it, it's, a, it's a bunch of like-minded people that are willing to work and not take shortcuts. I love it, man. So you married, you got kids? Yeah, I married, uh, I married at four kids. Um, big transitional year for us. One went off to college. Wow. One entered high school, <laughs> one entered kindergarten, and one entered pre-K. Oh my gosh, man. Yeah, running the gamut. Yeah, you sure are. Oh man, yeah, we, we've got five kids. So uh, it's, oh, it's wild. Win. Well, no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not sleeping much, but I'm where, you know, it's all good. Life is, life is good, man. So let's talk about, um, I just want to take a second and talk about this crazy world of CrossFit. I mean, I know it seems like it's really exploded the last few years, but clearly you jumped in on the train early on. And it kind of sounds like you had kind of this... Uh, experience meets opportunity that you'd kind of been working and doing the personal training thing. And then this CrossFit shows up. Uh, how did you decide to jump on that train and what have you seen the evolution of this thing become through the years? 
So when I jumped onto it, it was not what it is now. Is uh, I found it basically because I was a personal trainer. And I was always, you know, looking for the next best thing, and never felt like it's anything kind of fit what I was looking for. So I would take a certification or try a sport and try to find like I wanted fitness, and I was doing, um, you know, I was doing like bodybuilding stuff in college when I played rugby, and then getting out of college, I did triathlons. We worked up to doing a couple Ironman triathlons, and I never felt like I was. I always felt like there was a deficiency somewhere. And then found CrossFit, you know, being a bachelor and just kind of like nothing else to do, like just invested, you know, I'd spend late nights just kind of like trying to find the next greatest thing and found this really strange blog, you know, it's basically CrossFit, started doing it myself, started doing my clients. And um, in three months of doing CrossFit training, I got in better shape than doing three years of Ironman training. Wow. And when I, when I did that, it was like really like, um, eye-opening it was really like um it, it made sense to me the the crossfit here's the from a kind of um a person that likes the clarity to to what i'm trying to achieve crossfit was the first and this is going to sound really strange it crossfit was the first fitness protocol um association organization to define what fitness was what that sounds kind of like crazy but fitness is work capacity across broad time and mobile domains. And what that means is you have to be able to do things for a very short amount of time and very long amount of time. So if we're going to think about like um, biking, it's not the person that can win the Tour de France because then who's fitter, the guy that can win the Tour de France or the guy that can create the greatest amount of wattage on a bike. Like there's a good argument there. What we say is you have to have capacities at both ends. But we also say it's not just about biking. You have to have across modal domains, everything. So it's not just biking. It's bike, swim, run, like CrossFit. But it's also weightlifting and gymnastics and pull-ups. And it's shoveling snow and climbing mountains and putting a ruck back, rucksack on your back and trudging for 20 miles. It's basically, it's an all-inclusive program that's broad and not specialized. And Maybe it spoke to me because I was never elite at any one thing. I was just kind of good at a bunch of different things. So it kind of spoke to my natural capabilities as it was anyway. But the, the hard and fast definitions of what it was, was really what drew me into it as opposed to like these other people were just like, let's go and get fit, dot, dot, dot. And just kind of leave that hanging out there with like nothing really to chase. When CrossFit comes along and they can actually, now we can measure it, observe it and repeat it. Now we have scientific data and we can say this person is fitter than this person. That's a really exciting thing. It's not just who's fitter, the power lifter that can deadlift a thousand pounds or the guy that sets the, that wins the Boston marathon. Really good debate. Well, when you put these guys up against a, a battery of tests, you can actually figure out who the fittest actually is. If you know what fitness is, you know how to train for it. If you know how to train for it, then you can, then you can get it. And if you're not, it's just like, before it was like, let's go over there and do three sets of 10 bench press followed by, you know, some bicep curls and some push downs. And, you know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll do some abs and we're good. You know, Tuesday, Thursdays, we'll jump on the treadmill for 45 minutes. I don't know if that's fitness. Yeah, no, I, mean, I get it. That's great. Well, speaking of elite, uh, sounds like one of your specialties. And I'd like for you to talk about a little bit of the process of this, that you have trained some of the fittest people in the world. They've literally been tagged with that title. Uh, walk me through that. What was it like training someone through that? And, and what is it like for you as a leader, as a business owner to discover that you've got a skill set that can literally help people be the best in the world? I'd love to hear that process. Um, so it's the process is, uh, or just the, the, the t undertaking of the task is uh, phenomenally exciting. It's, um, it's something I, I, it's an environment I thrive in. I do like competition. I like things to be measured. I want to know where I stand. But it's also great because there's um, training these athletes, there's the quote unquote softer side, right? So it's kind of like a business, right? There is the measurables of like what's your market share, how much revenue you're producing, what's your profit, what's your run rate and everything else. But then there's the softer side. What's the kind of community and the culture you're creating? What's the brand and the feel for your company that you're putting out there? It's the same thing with coaching or athletics. There's, you know, the measurables of what's your VO2 max, what's your, what's your squat, you know, what kind of um, power can you produce for such a period of time? But then there's also like these intangibles of, um, you know, mental toughness and fortitude and grit and competitive excellence. And I, the, the approach that I take is um, kind of equally measured on both sides. I think generally coaches in most sports tend to lean towards one or the other. You know, it's kind of the difference of 
transactional versus transformational coaching. Transactional coaching being like, let's get you better at executing this on the floor. Whereas transformational coaching is like, let's give you some life skills that are going to benefit you later on when you move on. And I, I think both are equally as important. I'm not in this to like make people more polite or make sure they you know, make their bed in the morning. But I believe that better people do make better athletes. I believe that people do have patience and compassion. If people do have um, integrity and are trustworthy, if people have, um, you know, the ability to grit and grind and they have discipline and um, persistence, I think that that makes for better athletes. Now, just having those things by themselves certainly doesn't get you to win the CrossFit Games and get deemed the fittest on earth. You have to have the physical capabilities to go along with that. And we certainly put a lot of effort into that. And it's a matter of, uh, you know, some of the athletes move across the world to train here and other ones I train from afar, you know, over, uh, over Skype and uh, text and um, kind of like shared Google Docs and some backend systems. I love it. I love the methodology and the thought process behind that. Tell me a story of one of your fittest athletes that you trained and just kind of what that process looked like. And maybe there's a transformation in there. I'd love to just hear kind of the start to finish on that. Yeah, sure. So um, the, the athlete I'm the closest with is Katrin David's daughter. And she's, uh, the two, she's a two-time CrossFit Games champion. Um, and the year before I worked with her, she failed to make it through the qualifying rounds. So much like the Olympics where there's regional and national qualifiers to get to the, to the games, it's the same thing for CrossFit. Um, she, she failed to make it out of the European region. She's from Iceland. And she had been to the games two years prior to that. And she was kind of, um, to say she was devastated was, um, like she was like emotionally rocked by that experience. So much so that she, she called me up and we were friends. Um, one of my friends was actually coaching her at the time. So she'd been to the gym a few times. She called me up and said, I'd like you to coach me. Um, I'd like to move to Boston from Iceland and work with you. She came here and one of the few first training workouts we had, we were doing something and she was not performing up to her capabilities and had a little temper tantrum. She was a young 20 year old girl. She threw her weight belt across the room, yelled some stuff in a high pitched voice in Icelandic and stormed out the door and slammed it behind her. And what a great opportunity for a coach to like set the tone. So um, calmly walked behind her and uh, met her outside and said, you know, Captain, that's not the way we do it here. And kind of let that just sink in. And I wanted, I didn't want to lecture her. I didn't want that to be a, um, a moment where um, it, it was a berating or belittling or a, um, anything else other than to see how she would respond to that. And it was really the set the tone for what Katrin represents, which is this incredible growth mindset. She takes everything and learns from everything. It's what made her so great. So she took that experience and learned from it, has never once had an emotional outburst like that ever again. And then from there, we've been able to, she lived with us for, in my house for about four months before she got in her own apartment. It was phenomenal because uh, my family is very much pursuit of excellence focused, right? That's the way I kind of I run, run my family the same way where we do goals nights once a month at the dinner table. And we talk about um, what integrity means. And we talk about, um, you know, the, the power of a positive mindset, what mental toughness really is. And um, we have four family core values that everyone, even the four-year-old knows. And um, we have mantras that we use to kind of guide in common language. So then Katrin gets indoctrinated in that for four months where she's getting at the gym She's getting in the in between times in the car rides and she gets at the dinner table as well. She basically turns from this emotional, young, immature girl into this, what's really, re, she's regarded as the most mentally tough athlete in our sport. And our sport is considered one of the most mentally tough sports there is. Wow. I love that story, man. That's so great that you can just see through the power of time and repetitive and a positive thought process mindset can shift someone's entire character and their honestly the future of their life I, I absolutely love that well you talk about excellence let's talk about this book chasing excellence you've written this what is this book all about so it's basically the process that i use to train um uh, my athletes but specifically it kind of chronicles the 2016 crossfit games season and really the crossfit games um competition it's um i trained matt fraser and uh captain david's daughter who both ended up winning the titles of uh, fittest on earth that year so it's, it, it uses the events and their training uh, protocols, basically in the, to, to highlight some lessons that um, I'm trying to instill. So basically each chapter um, uses an event at the games 
to tell a story about a lesson to be learned. So for example, um, um, like humility, like the ability to like not have an ego. So Matt Fraser, who is a, a dominant athlete in our sport now, he's won three consecutive years by the largest margin ever, was not a strong sprinter when he competed in the, uh, the games of previous years. He had the humility to say, I'm going to go to the local high school track team. He's this, he's a 25 year old man with a beard and tattoos who drives, drives a Harley. He was going to go to the local high school team and train with these 13 and 14 year olds and get smoked on a daily basis by these kids who the biggest part of their legs is their knees. And he basically got incredibly good. He came in, I think second place in the sprint the next year because he was so humble. So we use kind of the examples of the games and tie it to a principle and then teach a lesson through the, through the story of the games. I love it. And you have a podcast called Chasing Excellence as well. What is that about? What are the kind of the conversations you get into on, on the podcast? Yeah, so it's kind of, um, I'm speaking to my, my community is kind of the CrossFit community, but um, it does kind of uh, have some gray area and bleed over to some other stuff. So we kind of talk to three different um, groups and it's uh, athletes and coaches for sure inside the CrossFit community. So we'll talk about things like um, you know, how to improve, um, how to, how to eat for performance. Um, and then we'll talk about things like business. So I own, um, a few gyms and, um, and have created a successful, um, online, um, software as a subscription business. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of life and family in general. So there's kind of three buckets that we kind of use to lead our discussions. Let's take a second and dive into the entrepreneurial side of this thing. Cause you know, I, I'm sure some principles kind of carry over from being a trainer and, you know, getting people to become great athletes and coaches and all that jazz. But talk to me about some of the things maybe that you learned along the way from that, maybe the skill sets of being a coach to being an entrepreneur to building a business, some real practical steps, because we've got entrepreneurs listening here that could, I'm sure would be would love to hear your journey and some of the things you learned along the way. While, while I kind of grew up in it with an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, that did not translate over into being a good entrepreneur when I started off. I kind of excelled in the, the coaching realm, but because you're a good cook doesn't mean you're good be a good restaurant owner. The trap I fell into was like, I'm going to open this gym. And uh, next thing I knew, the gym was running my life. And I was an employee to my business. And I hadn't learned the skills yet to run a business. So through kind of necessity because I was, you know, got to the point where I was working eight hour work weeks and stressed, you know, while I loved my work and I, I really enjoyed being there. That's kind of, it's an, it's an unsustainable path. So how do I create this into a sustainable path? So I think it all starts with, um, you know, if it's an individual that you're coaching or if it's a team, it's the culture that you create and creating the right environment and the right team dynamics. And I know you've had Lincioni on your, your podcast and I'm a huge fan of um, his work, The Ideal Team Player, which he's written, is one of the books that we have every single one of our employees read before they come on board. It's part of our on-ramp process. And we have as our um, core values, humble, hungry, and people smart, just as he advocates. That sets the tone for everything there. From that, I've kind of expanded that to really dive and ex explain and um, conceptualize what it means to be humble, hungry, and smart. It's not just a matter of this like, putting on a coffee mug, putting on posters, putting on t-shirts, like we are humble, hungry, and smart. We lead off every one of our coaches meetings by everyone going around the table and giving an example of how being humble, hungry, and smart was represented in the last week by one of the other team members. And then I um, go through for each one of those core values, we have five principles that underline each of those. And at each meeting, I go through one of those principles in detail, it takes about 20 minutes and give some background stories because I believe story is the best way to tell anything. Um, you know, kind of like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Daniel Coyle and Culture Code, mm -hmm. kind of that type of stuff. Create our own language, create a, a feel for what we mean by, you know, when we talk about humility, there's a, there's a lot that kind of like, everyone's got backgrounds differently. You know? So like, everyone came from somewhere different and humility means something different from somebody, from one person on your team to somebody else. So we're trying to create this common vernacular of what is humility to us? And for us, it's mostly about the willingness and to accept feedback. It's that truly that growth mindset. And we are here to get better. The worst thing in the world for me is that five years from now, my business is in the exact same place it is right now. Like, no thanks, I'm out. Like, I, don't, I want no part of that. Well, if that's the case, the only way we can grow is if we have the humility to accept areas that we can improve upon. 
So we spend a lot of effort and I spend a lot of time and effort really clarifying what those three core values mean by defined principles, stories, and kind of referencing what those things are. Once you have those kind of core values and principles, the next thing that I've used, both whether it's athletes or um, what I've done from an entrepreneurial standpoint, is uh, creating clarity in terms of expectations. So I, I'm a big fan of defining a process. You know, whether you talk about like Bill Belichick or Nick Saban type stuff, you know, the process. You know, it's like really detailing, defining what that is. So for my athletes, I, I um, you know, I want them to sleep better. Well. Telling someone to sleep better isn't a whole lot more helpful than telling them nothing at all because everybody knows that they're supposed to sleep more and better. So what we do is we define what is the process of sleeping better. And it entails all the specifics, setting your room to between um, 62 and 68 degrees, making sure that you have blackout shades so there's no light coming through, no um, alarm clocks. Um, instead, we have um, glow lights like the Philips glow lights so you wake up softly. We have um, no blue light TV, um, smartphones, or iPads two hours before bed, no drinking 90 minutes before bed. So we lay out this huge process and detail it so people can actually track exactly what's expected of them. Now when I say, how'd you sleep last night? It's not a matter of like, good. It's a matter of like, you know, I would, I would score my sleep probably like a 65%. Okay, what can we do to improve it? And you bring that over to the, 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 the business side of things. So instead of, you know, um, asking someone like how their, how their class went, really detailing what the class procedures are, you know, what, it, what's involved in the first 15 minutes before class, what's the expectations. It's just really detailing out the roles and expectations of the job. So it takes away the mystery. I think that if there's, um, you know, I think the disciplined dog is the really happy dog. The dog that doesn't know the rules is the one that's kind of like the, the most unhappy. And it's the same thing for employees. I think that discipline and clarity brings autonomy and freedom. And if they have that autonomy and uh, freedom, then they're kind of happy, but they're not going to have that unless they know really, really well what's expected of them, not only on a day to day, but kind of like an hour by hour basis. Yeah. Well, let's take a second and talk about discipline because it is important as a business owner and even just a human being in general to have a happy and I think thriving life. Have you always been disciplined? Uh, and if you haven't, or you've had to grow an area, what are some ways, what are some ways you do that to grow in the area of discipline? I, I'm, I've always grown up kind of like the discipline mindset. I, I, I enjoy discipline because I, I, again, I think it brings certain levels of other freedom to me. So um, just an example of that is um, all through high school, I didn't drink or smoke or do drugs because I liked the discipline of being different and wanting to do that. Um, when I graduated college, I went 12 years without having a, um, a sweet, a baked good, soda or anything like I. I, um, from the time I was like about 23 to 35, I literally did not have um, a cookie, a cracker, uh, anything until <laughs> one day when my wife was pregnant um, with our third, we went to the, to the kids with ice cream. And for some reason, I just, after 12 years, I was like, I'm going to have a look at that ice cream. I, I, I do. I enjoy this one life. I like it. Um, but I, I realize that not everyone is like that. And I believe that the way to do that, regardless of anything, d discipline is um, discipline, mental toughness, grit, fortitude, all those things that we feel like are innate, born into um, character traits, I think are learned skills. I don't like to call them traits because traits be assume that it's part of your um, innate upbringing and DNA and that's what you're born for. I think it's learned. And like anything, if you were to learn any skill, whether it's piano or typing or how to drive fast around a race car you know it's the, the idea behind it is break it down into really manageable steps and from there reward but then immediately challenge again so if you wanted someone to learn how to type you would not give them type the keyboard and be like don't look at the keyboard and let's try and type 100 words a minute you're setting someone for failure so similar you wouldn't be like Okay, we're gonna try and work on your discipline with eating. Let's not eat a sweet for 12 years. Like, they're gonna fail. So with the keyboard, what you do is you're like, look at the keyboard. Let's put your hands on the, on the home keys. Now let's from there, let's do like D, E, D, E, D, E. Great, you did it. A little spark, a little ignite. I'm feeling good, I can do this. I can be good at this. Same thing with the food thing. It's like, okay, let's try to change breakfast tomorrow. So instead of going for your Frosted Flakes or your pancakes, Let's instead try to have eggs. Okay, did you do it? 
Oh my God, it's amazing. Do you know how hard it is what you just did? That's phenomenal. Now you just layer in and they, they create this discipline called discipline or mental toughness where they become aware of the little voice inside their head that controls the decisions. You know, it's, if you try to do like one big broad brushstroke to create better discipline, well, the average person makes 240 nutritional choices a day. You can't do 240 in one day. You got to make one. So let's pare it down to the smallest little thing. And this is just what you know, Malcolm Gladwell calls it like deep practice or maybe it's Erickson, you know, it's that type of stuff where you break it down into tiny little steps and just focus on that one little step, become really good at that. And then we'll do another step, another step, another step. And then from there, you all of a sudden have discipline. All right. Well, let's take a second. You've got these two very different businesses. I mean, I know they're in the same kind of niche. You've got this, you've got your own box that multiple, right? Is it multiple locations? We're in, we have four right now. Okay, you have four. Um, and for people who don't know a, a box, how would you? Box is, 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 is a CrossFit gym. Okay, yeah, I just you know, and then um, and then you've got the subscription based online service. Um, what were some of the things that surprised you in leading these two different entities? Same principles, or or there's some stuff that surprised you in leading that? I, th I think um, business principles are business principles, but there's definitely some uniqueness to it. So software as a subscription, which is the comp train methodology, which basically we put up, here's a workout to do today. And people jump on it and they follow along. And it's breaking down by age groups and kind of what your goals and what you're trying to do. Um, the other model I have, which is running a gym. The gym one is way more uh, customer service focused. It's about creating, giving the people the best hour of their day. It's, it's like owning, owning a restaurant. Like you got the best food in the world, but if your wait staff sucks, no one's coming. You got the best food in the world, but if it's, you know, a crappy um, uh, environment where it's like dirty and there's rats running around, no one's coming. So it's kind of this more of a 360 degree approach, but really focus on giving people, we call it the best hour of their day. Whereas the software subscription is more about, um, I, I think it's more like in line with a more of a traditional business methodology where it's, um, you know, for this community and the startup community, it's, we, it's very much a startup type thing where, um, you have this conceptual idea, you create, a, a, you beta test it, you create an MVP, a minimal viable product, you go out to the market with it, you test it, you get feedback, you iterate, you get feedback, you iterate, and then all of a sudden you try and make these kind of like leaps and jumps in certain areas when it's appropriate. So while the, um, the gym methodology is kind of like very linear, you get another member, you get another member, the software business is uh, much more exponential. And it's, uh, I think the, the software one's a little more traditional business focused, whereas the other one is really kind of like, get people to like you. We're in a relationship business. It's like, you're asking people to come hang out with you for two hours a day. So if they don't like you, like, I don't care how, what kind of results you get and they're not coming back. No, it's good, man. I like it. I love that you, you've got your kind of feet in both of those arenas. All right. So there's an entrepreneur listening on the deal and they've been doing CrossFit and they love it. And they're like, I think. I think I want to start and open up my own box. What do you, what advice do you tell that person? Okay. Uh, the first one would be, um, uh, dig in a little bit harder because from the outside looking in, it looks like, like it looks like a no brainer. It's like it, what CrossFit has done is it's flipped the model upside down. So what it used to be, the model used to be, if you want to open up a gym was really high startup costs, really high rent, and then super, super low, tuition. Meaning if you want to open up a gym, it's going to cost you $2 million to buy the equipment, secure the location. And then from there, you have to pay rent every single month of, you know, 40, 50, a hundred thousand dollars a month for this huge facility. And then you, the goal is charge as little as you can for each member. You know, 999 is the model right now. What CrossFit did was the opposite. You only need $3,000 to get affiliated. You can start with one barbell and then from, you can open up in a park and from there, you're going to charge people $200 a month. So it's like, this is a no brainer. It's unbelievable. There is, it depend, there, it's not as much of a no brainer as people think. It just looks like the, 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 the area between expenses and revenue is just massive. But uh, if you're going to run a top notch facility, there are inherent um, fixed and variable costs that uh, you kind of have to dig into. And that would be my suggestion is people do is figure out what are the things that you can't see that you're going to have to pay for. 
you know, tight, like stupid little things. Like I'm going to have to pay for a music subscription service check. I know it's only 10 bucks a month, but we want to no know commercials. We want it to be good. It's maybe a little bit more. We need to um, get paper towels. So variable cost. As we get more members, we need more paper towels. When we started off, our water bill was 300 bucks a month. Now it's 1400 bucks a month. Like there's differences between like how you go about, you just have to kind of dig into um, what this looks like. And then from there is try to run it as lean as possible, but with excellence always at the forefront. Most people think that they have to hire all these coaches and you don't. You can run this thing really lean. It's you and your girlfriend and one other person is how you operate this thing. And then from there, you don't need a front desk staff because the other coaches that aren't coaching are your front desk staff. You kind of like dip into other stuff. Hire coaches based off of first and foremost off of character. Are they humble, hungry, and smart? Then secondly, off of their um, ability, their coaching ability. And third, off of skill sets, which is can they do marketing? Can they do social media? Can they work the front desk? Can they do some... Um, membership software stuff? Do they have some data analytics? Can they um, fix leaky faucets? You know, and then the last thing I would do is just, uh, not the last thing, but kind of last on that priority list would be um, work hard with the, the landlord to try to get some freebies. You know, it's because the landlord says it's five grand a month doesn't mean on day one, it's five grand a month. You as an entrepreneur have the right to go in there and say, I need some leeway to start my business. Can I have the first six weeks, two months, three months free. He was like, no. He's like, okay, great. Then can you help me with the build out costs? Can you put in the showers for me? Instead of this is benefiting your building. Like this is when I walk away, you now have showers. You now have um, a new HVAC unit. You have a new roof. Like don't think that just because you're walking into the business and they're handing you something that you have no say in, um, in kind of the, the lease negotiations. No, that's good. All right. So if you're, if you're starting today, would you say open a box or do an online subscription service? Which one do you think is a better way to go? Open up a box because online subscription service, you need some credibility behind you. You know, the reason that people started, the way that our business went was um, it did not, it started completely organically. I was training some high level athletes and instead of me emailing them every day, I just created a free blog. I was like, here's what we're doing today, guys. And they would respond back in and write some comments and then they shared it with one of their buddies. And that buddy shared it with somebody else at another gym. And that shared with somebody else. And all of a sudden it went from, you know, these six athletes I was training to 600. And then within a year, it was 10,000. And then right now we have, you know, um, you know we, we have about a mail list of about 50,000 50, people on a mail list. You know, we have about, you know, there, there's no way of telling exactly how many people follow the free programming. But, you know, we have uh, a, a good little market for, for our paid programming as well. So that was a really organic growth based off the credibility that we had. People wanted to follow it because we had won the CrossFit Games. You know, it's like they've done it. They know what they're doing. Let's follow them. You didn't go buy 100,000 Instagram followers and then try and, <laughs> you know, all the hacks to grow that. Well, man, what a great story. I love your journey. I really appreciate you sharing it. Before we take off, we like, kind of like to ask these three last questions before we get going. And it sounds a little like this. What's a book, and you talked about one, but what's a book that's impacted your entrepreneurial journey? If you were going to start a business today, any business from scratch with technology and all that, you know, when you started years ago, you know where we're at now, what would you start? Would you do the same thing? Would you try something different? And then lastly, what advice would you give to the younger you? So what's an entre entrepreneurial book? And I see all these books behind you here. What's an entrepreneurial book that has changed your life? First one would be, it's, I'm going to give two because the first one's almost like a default for me. It's, it's Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But it's just like everyone says that. It's like, if you haven't read that, you got to. It's like, you know, it's like playing hockey and not watching Miracle. It's like, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a gimme. Yeah. So the next one after that is Essentialism um, by Greg McCown. It's um, when, when you start a business, I don't care what the business is. If you're an entrepreneur, you're going to get pulled in a thousand different directions and you're going to get so, so busy putting out fires and doing urgent stuff. It's, it's a phenomenal approach to life and business. So um, that's the book I would, I would definitely go towards. Um, in terms of starting a business, I'm, I feel like I still am starting a business. So it would sure. be the same. Uh, I'm definitely, we are not a mature business whatsoever. I feel like every day is a, is a super exciting um, opportunity to learn so, so much more. So I, I'm, 
I feel like we're really at the infancy of what we're doing um, in terms of the comp train um, programming subscription business. Um, but what I, what I would like to do down the road is uh, the disruptive and the, the bold and the, um, you know, the exponential one would be to kind of combine all the wearable technologies and the AI and um, the, the biohacking and create something that could do, you wake up in the morning and says, Chris, the perfect breakfast based off of your gut microbiome, your fasting glucose, your sleep, your recovery, your training yesterday is waiting for you downstairs. And the perfect amount, the perfect educational resource for you is waiting for you next to the toilet so you can read it while you're doing your thing. And then on your watch is the exact perfect workout for you to do today. That stuff is coming and I'm kind of excited about it. And I think that I, I can help out with the training side of that, but the other stuff I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, wearables and some yeah. of the technology it's coming is unbelievable. So cool. And then um, lastly, and the, what advice yeah. would you give to the younger you? have confidence that you're doing it the right way. You know, I think that there's so much second guessing that goes into everything that we, that we as entrepreneurs do. Um, and I really believe that when I've relied on my gut, I've made the right decisions. So it would be to go back and just um, take in all the advice you possibly can learn as much as you can from every interaction, from every experience, from every resource you possibly can but then don't necessarily follow suit. Digest it, take the best practice from everybody, and then what fits you in your situation right now and go with your gut on that. I think I have a tendency to like, I get really excited about new material and um, I have a tendency to kind of like dive head first, like this is amazing, let's go do this. And um, if you take a kind of like a 10,000 foot view, figure out what's right for you me right now at this moment um and just totally trust it go with it and go full speed i think a plan b is a plan to fail so i think that you just kind of go with plan a and um you know burn the ships go all in and and see what comes of it and if it doesn't you'll learn a lot from it and that's not a loss that's great man i love it and i wonder too if there's there's that wrestle of like learning and growing and, and failing, but at the same time, trying to be excellent as well. You know, excellence is such a big deal for you, you know, and I've come to value excellence over the last few years. And I'm sure that's just part of it going like, I want to do this excellently, but I, I know that failing is a part of it. You know, it's probably that tension. Yeah. I think that's the only way you, you find excellence. I don't, I, so I'm kind of big into definitions. And I don't, I, I think there's a big difference between excellence and perfection. Perfection is unattainable and it does not exist. But I kind of like the Vince Lombardi quote, which is, you know, if we chase perfection, we may harness excellence. That's great. Good old Vince, the man. So, well, Ben, thank you so much for coming on here. I know there's a lot of people who are going to want to follow you, look up your company. Where, where, where can they get all of that information? Uh, the easiest one is benbergeron.com. Very cool. Very cool, man. Well, thanks again for doing what you do, for sharing your story and literally impacting people's lives. And I really, really means a lot. Well, right back to you. You're doing the same stuff. So appreciate you and the platform that you've built. So thank you. Absolutely, brother. Take care. All right. Well, if, look, if I'm trying to be the world's fittest athlete, I am going to hire Ben Bergeron. What a great conversation. What a great guy. Go check him out on social media, follow him, and check out all he's doing in the CrossFit world and community. Well, that's a wrap for this episode. As always, take a second, subscribe, rate, review the podcast, and share it with your friends. Right there, smash that share button, share it, text it to a friend of yours, say, hey, I think you'll really like this conversation. I know you know someone in CrossFit. Share this episode with them. I know they'll enjoy it. And then lastly, if you haven't got a chance, head on over to startupcamp.com. Our focus is you, the entrepreneur, helping you build the business and the life that you've always wanted. And we have some courses over there 
that are perfect for what you want to do. We've got an Amazon course to help you understand how to go from zero to building your own Amazon business. We've got a course on photography. If you're a photographer out there and you're like trying to figure out how to scale and build your photography business, we're going to teach you everything you need to know. We're going to talk about pricing, things that nobody talks about in the industry. And then we've also got business boot camp. It's a great course for someone who says, look, I'm trying to figure out all the ins and outs of business and I need it all. Well, we've got logo and website and business creation. Everything you need to know is right there. It's taught by Dale Partridge. He has started multiple six and seven figure businesses and you are going to love every second of it. So head on over to startupcamp.com, find the course that works best for you and get started building your business today. Well, that is a wrap on this episode. Let's all go do some push-ups for Coach Ben, and we will catch you on the next episode of the StartupCamp.com podcast.